February 1848, barricades were once again erected in the streets of Paris, as they had been in the original French Revolution and again in 1830 with the fall of the Bourbon Restoration. Some of the events of 1848 were captured in a novel by Victor Hugo, Le Miserable, and this music is from the contemporary stage spectacular by Andrew Lloyd Webber of the same name. The Miserable is a very sentimental novel and the stage adaptation even more so, but it does deal with the underlying causes of the Revolution of 1848. But France was no different to any other part of Europe at this time, in the sense there was growing inequality and unrest amongst both the, the peasantry and the uh, new urban working classes, the proletariat of factory workers and sort of semi-employed day labourers, casual labourers, very insecure people. But what was different about France was the political context. First of all, the idea of revolution in France was patriotic and the Paris Revolution of 1848 has the aspect of being a national revolution as well. And as we shall see, the end game of the French Revolution of 1848 was not the socialist, liberal uh, utopia that they were singing about there in uh, the Andrew Lloyd Webber musical, but a conservative, nationalistic, patriotic empire, um, the second empire under Louis Napoleon III, uh, which we'll come to. So revolution in France and in Paris was, was a patriotic thing to do, a nationalistic thing to do, and part of that zeitgeist, if we're going to use that Hegelian term, the spirit of the times, Louis Philippe. Louis Philippe had come to power in 1830 promising liberal reforms of all sorts, and he did that. He instituted a, a type of freedom of the press, a very free press relatively in France in the 1830s, a relatively free intellectual climate of Paris in the 1830s had encouraged the socialist movement, people like Proudhon and Saint-Simon, to publish their tracts and pamphlets, which we discussed in a previous webcast lecture. And Louis-Philippe had also promised steady extension of the franchise before 1830 under the Bourbons. Less than 50,000 people in a country of, what, 20 or 25 million uh, had the right to vote. Louis-Philippe extended that to about a quarter of a million but there was still a land qualification to vote in order to vote in the National Assembly under the uh, bourgeois monarchy, under the monarchy of Louis-Philippe and the government of Guizot. Uh, one had to own substantial amounts of land. Through the 1830s, the liberal middle classes and the new industrial bourgeoisie, the owners of the growing factory system, people associated with the railways, the banking sector, uh, had demanded direct representation, such as their op opposite numbers in England had obtained after the Great Reform Act in 1832 in England. But Louis Philippe was very resistant to this. In the way of these things, people come in as dictators and liberal liberators and so on, but once they get power, they find it's much more convenient to leave things as they are. And this was particularly the case as the parliaments under Louis Philippe's reign were notoriously corrupt. And one problem of the new freedom of the press was that that was widely written about. And so there was a feeling that the monarchy of 1830 had been put in power by the will of the people, and particularly by the will of the, the kind of liberal, uh, enlightened people of Paris, uh, and then simply failed to deliver, and that it was time once again to rise up and uh, cleanse the monarchy. In 1846, things came to a head with the brutal suppression by the central army of sporadic peasant revolts following a failure of the harvest in that year which saw a widespread starvation in the countryside that coincided with a series of corruption scandals in the parliament and a financial crisis. One problem for the July monarchy was that it had really failed to impose taxation or collect it effectively because its popularity was so limited outside of Paris. The same sorts of processes of mechanisation of agriculture and ruin in the countryside were going on in France, and one result of this was the steady migration of uh, landless former peasants and other destitute people into Paris. So by 1848, there were very, very large number, very large numbers of very, very poor people uh, just eking out a living by begging, prostitution, and thieving. And these are the sorts of characters, Le Miserable, that are portrayed in Victor Hugo's book. At the same time, the middle-class agitation for an extension of the vote 
was intensifying, and it was this which led to the actual outbreak of the revolution. February 1848, the government banned any further mass meetings which were aimed at campaigning for parliamentary reform. In event, the meetings were held anyway, and barricades were erected to prevent the authorities breaking up the meetings. When it was clear that the government no longer had control of the streets of Paris, Guizot, the Prime Minister, resigned. There was then a huge demonstration outside the Foreign Ministry, and soldiers, apparently in what was an accident, began firing on the crowd and killed 50 or more people. But when news of that spread, the whole of Paris uh, went up in flames, fires were started, barricades were formed everywhere, uh, with the demand that a new National Assembly should be called immediately to promulgate a new constitution for France. Louis-Philippe abdicated and went into exile in England. A new provisional government was formed, pending the calling of a new National Assembly, which was to be done on the basis of universal male suffrage. All males over the age of, I think, 21 were going to vote in that. The new provisional government was immediately split between the socialists on the one hand and the national liberals on the other. The socialists were led by Louis Blanc, who had already drawn up a scheme of national workshops to deal with the unemployed. A national right to work was promulgated, whereby anybody suffering from rural poverty or anybody at all who uh, couldn't get enough wages where they were at the moment could come to a national workshop and be guaranteed a job. By May 1848, there were at least 100,000 people working in the national workshops and receiving state money, and more and more people were arriving from the countryside all the time. This brought about immediate uh, ruin of the already bankrupt state finances. The whole system of currency, credit and banking collapsed amid general chaos. When the national election on a universal franchise, universal male franchise, was held, it produced an overwhelmingly right-wing and conservative National Assembly, reflecting the Catholicism and conservatism of the French countryside and the peasants who had the vote for the first time. One of the first acts of the new conservative government was to close down the national workshops and thereby deprive the 100,000 or perhaps as many as 200,000 former lead destitute people of their livelihood in the national workshops. The proletariat, if you will, resisted this with force. They threw up new barricades and the, the picture you can see here with this webcast, if you're looking, Paris in 1848 by Vernet, shows workers under the red flag. Um, they, threw, they tore down the uh, tricolor of the bourgeois republic and um, uh, adopted the, fl the red flag of the working class international and for several days in june 1848 they fought a running battle with the uh, national republican army of what was now the french second republic this revolt consciously a working class revolt with a socialist ideology that was the first time that had ever happened in europe on any significant s scale uh, was put down with uh, predictable brutality and there was a right-wing political reaction to what had been seen as the, the chaos of the June days and the attempted socialist uprising. The new bourgeois republic had a constitution similar to the United States where it had a directly elected National Assembly and, importantly, a directly elected president. Now, as part of the conservative mood in France in 1848 in reaction to the revolution in Paris, the more conservative countryside voted in that election for Louis Bonaparte, a relative of Napoleon Bonaparte, who was elected as president of the Second Republic. But a few years later, in 1852, Louis Bonaparte conducted a military coup, abolished democracy, and installed himself as Emperor Napoleon III of France. Once again, what had started out as a revolutionary movement for liberalism, internationalism, and human rights ended up with the creation of a military dictatorship bent on military conquest, expansion, and imperialism.